things. I'm preparing myself for So I've got actually nine things written down for uh, this. Um, we're going to learn staff base. Should have that. And I'll just quickly go through the nine themes and add in quickly number 10, because that's what we're going to do we add one in. So the tractate sukkah number one is it starts with the height of a sukkah, that the sukkah that's higher than 20 amo to amma is generally considered uh, this big, called six tvachim. So uh, that's how they used to measure things, Kenny. They used like their bodies to measure stuff. If you were little or big, it's like uh, you mess everything up. So, so, uh, <laughs> so why does it? Why does the whole tractate start with that? And number two is the Rashi. First Rashi in Sukkah says something. It says that the Gemara will explain an argument between the rabbis and Rabbi Huda, and that's the common way that Rashi defers. An explanation of a, of a given statement, if it's going to be elaborated on or really explained later in the Gemara. It's a classic Raji says, the Gemara will explain it. But at face value, and I believe the Pnei Yeshua notes this, it does not explain in the Gemara the debate between Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis. So I'll get to what the debate is, but it doesn't seem to explain it. So why is Rashi saying that? It does explain. There are three opinions of why the rabbis say what they say, Rabba, Rabseir, and Rabba, but that's not about Rabbi Yehuda versus the rabbis, which is the two tonight mentioned in the Mishnah. So that's a serious question, and we could take a look and see how to answer that. Number three is if if uh, the Rashi, Dibri Hamaslil Shechamasa, says a very interesting thing, that if you have less schach in the sukkah, that the muat is that by the fact that there's so little schach, that's a minority of, of the sukkah's ceiling is schach, it's as if there's no schach, because the majority nullifies the minority, which is a very strange expression to use when you're talking about schach. You're not talking about a tarubos, you're not talking about a mixture of kosher and non kosher of the normal. And Rabbi Soloveitcher talks about that in his Rishima Shiurim. I don't know if we can add anything in addition to that. And number four is a famous Rashi that says, the end of that same Rashi that we were just quoting, number three, says the name of the sukkah is named after the schach, like sukkah schach. In other words, the essence of the sukkah is schach, which is what about the walls? How do they play in? What about the what about the floor of the sukkah? Right, so these are ultimately going to be, as Rabbi Soloveitchik points out in the Shema Shiorim, a debate between what he considers Rashi on the one side and the Rambam on the other side in terms of the, the definition of sukkah. Is it just the schach or is it the schach on the walls, as Maimonides will suggest, based on the reading of Rabbi Soloveitchik? Number five, and by the way, I'm going to explain all of these things. So if you don't understand it, that's good. Number five is there's a mission in Arabin that starts out with a parallel to our Gemara that talks about something about 20 Amos. And yet there, the primary explanation that's given as to why it would be not kosher or would be kosher according to Rabbi Yehuda is different than what our Gemara seems to talk about and why is that or is that even the case number six is two different uses of a word takanta which is to fix something versus psula which is something is not okay it's puzzle it's disqualified 
And the first answer to the Gemara is, is depends whether we're talking about something biblical or rabbinic. When it's biblical, we say the word pasal, that it's it's no good. And when it's rabbinic, we say fix it. And how to understand that? Rashi and Toshas each have a different way of understanding that. Number seven is Leman Yedu Sechem. That's the interpretation given by Rabba in order that the generations should know that I, I cause you to leave Egypt. Which Rabba interprets it halachically in terms of the height of the Sukkah. But Rashi brings down the Pshuto Shomikra, what he considers the more obvious reading of the text, which is it refers to Hekef and Anayakavah, knowing that we were protected by God's clouds of glory. And how do those two, does Rabba hold that you still need to have awareness of the miracle of the Anayakavah when you're in the Sukkah, as well as the limits of the height of the Sukkah, according to Rashi. Number eight. Sometimes we'll hear some things about new halachas, new laws. People discover bugs and and uh, hey, Alicia, they discover the bugs in the co coca pods in the water, right? So, so the question is. Do you think they didn't know a hundred years ago that there was some little, you know, microscopic things in the water? So, or strawberries. Some rabbi comes up with a thing that strawberries have these tiny bugs in them, right? So, is Torah science? Does Torah believe in science as part of a way of interpreting how to perform a mitzvah? Or is it science is good as science, but it's nothing to do with how to interpret a mitzvah. It's two separate disciplines. So that's number eight. Rabbi Zera knows a little bit about what do you call where the sun, the the the, the no the equator, like where it's like where the sun is not in the center, like where it's not the tropics versus well, the way the sun is, it's on a certain, it's not above us 100%. And it's the side, right? Rebzer observed that, and he, therefore, because of that, interprets the reality, a scientific reality, to, in, to impact how he sees the mitzvah of sukkah should be observed in terms of the building of the sukkah. So, in other words, is Rebzer one of these first, is he preceding these modern rabbis that are, Mostly, probably, not mostly, but probably often misinterpreting the role of science in deciding halacha. Not always, but often. There's a medium. So where where, where does your Abzera fit into this? Number eight, number that's at number eight, number nine. If Abzera is in fact a scientist, how does he answer Abaya's question? Because Abaya has a challenge. It's like if you're gonna get all scientific. I'll tell you another scientific reality that's going to create another problem for you. In other words, once you start using science, where do you end? You, you plug one hole, then another hole comes up. And he has an answer, and we're going to do that. And the number 10, which I didn't have a chance to write down, is what is the ruling of the post -game? How do we actually rule what the reason of why a sukkah cannot be higher than 20 amot? Is it brava? I'm sorry, Rabba, Rava, and Rabzera. Which one of the three is it? There are some halachic differences. And also, for bonus points, if we could try to figure out a little bit about who Rabba is, and who Rabzera is, and who Rava is, and if it influences at all their opinions. By the way, Alicia, I, I, your father has, I think, a chapter in one of his books on Rava and Abaya, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he does. Very well, beautiful. Uh, piece on R Rav and Abaya are phenomenally important to understanding how to learn the Gemara. And actually, we're going to learn about Rav and Abaya today because Rav argues not on, on almost everyone. I'm sorry, Abaya. Abaya is not mentioned here. I'm only mentioning 
Rabba, Rab Zerah, and Rabba. But, but Abaya's job is to give most of these rabbis a hard time. Okay? So we'll see how he does that in this chapter. Okay, so let's take a look at the Gemara. So, if you didn't understand it, it's okay. The, the Mishnah is from about um, the the common era, from around the beginning of the common era, slightly before the you know the Hillel and Shammai were a little bit before the common era, and that went for like 150, 200, you know, 150 years, and then the Talmudic period went from like the year 200 to the year 400 or so. Yeah. Now again, it went later. It went later, and uh, yeah, yeah, it went later. Some there's a whole another discussion for JTS about things we're not going to talk about. <laughs> so that's the, about about when you know when was really the close of the Talmud. Um, but th but that's not for now. So let's go back to number one, which is the Gemara begins right. Sukkoshi Gavoa Lamaila Master Amma Psula Rabbi Masher. That's the first the first debate in the whole tract. You have to understand what what exactly made Rabbi Yehuda Nasi bring this discussion right in the beginning, which is that a sukkah that's higher than twenty amot is disqualified. The word is possible, sula. And Rabbi Yehuda disagrees and says it's kosher. Now, there's a parallel Gemara to this Mishnah in Erevin. The first Mishnah in Erevin also starts with a similar line, which is a Mavoy Shihu Gavo Masim Ama Yimayim. A Mavoy is a certain type of domain that Biblically is considered private, but rabbinically is considered public in some sense because it looks like it has a public element to it. And you have to make a hecker. You have to make some visible thing that closes off the side of it that's open to the public thoroughfare. Okay? And that's like, uh, today we would call it an Arab, right? It's, it's an Arab, basically. But it can't be higher, that that string or that pole can't be higher than 20 amma, which would mean, by the way, today also, if you have an Arab and the Arab is higher than 20 amma, technically it would be too high and you'd have to lower it. So there we're going to get into in number five some of the distinctions between the reasons given there, there it's very connected to the size of the various chambers and the doors of the temple. And here it doesn't seem to be connected to that at all in the debate between Rabbi Huda and the, there's this likewise debate, Rabbi Huda says it's allowed, even 40 amos is allowed. And the rabbis said, no, if it's over 20 amos, it's not close. There's a big difference, yeah. So why are we starting with the height? of the sukkah. Now, Reb Nachman of Wrestle suggests, I know I'm going straight to Reb Nachman, I'm not really waiting long enough, is that if you look at the definitions of the height of too high or too low, what it symbolizes is some relationship with God that isn't yet a relationship. You're, you're not able to process it in your mind at all because it's totally above you. It's totally removed from you. It, it might have a relationship in terms of faith that you can believe, but it's belief because there's a distance between you and that reality. It's not real. So you you compensate for that by having a muna, by saying, I, 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 I believe in this thing, even though I don't feel the thing, I don't understand the thing. 
So, and, and, and even within faith, Rabbi Nachman distinguishes between a faith that feels very distant from you and the faith that seems not so distant. It's it's within the realm of being, being able to like grasp it in my head, even if it's still slightly above that. So according to Rabbi Nachman, the, the above 20 almas is almost to quote the writing of a tremendous scholar of of uh, of Hasidism um, who died a tragic death. I don't want to say how he died. You can look it up. His name is Weiss. And I made the mistake of quoting him in an article and, and Breslovers didn't, some particular Breslov scholar didn't take well to it because he says that for a Nachman, there's like this, this big gap between the person and God that he's you know, he feels that talks about this distance a lot. Okay, and and in a sense, for Nachman saying a circle higher than twenty amas, that's bringing out that gap. You're not you're you're not close to God, even if you say God exists there. It's pure faith without any connection more than that. It, it, it's it, it's almost hurts. So that's according to Rav Nachman that would make sense why the sukkah is starting with. Sukkah higher than 20 amas is in kosher. As nice as faith is, we need it to be within the realm of this. It has to be close enough that I can almost grasp it, even if I can't fully understand it. But it shouldn't feel so distant to me that I feel so far away from God. So that's from nothing. Then a more simple level would be, again, we already have an existing track date. That starts with a mavoi that's higher than 20 amot. That's the second, that's the third track in the Shas, Red Bachot, Shabbos Erevin. So Sukkot is following a pattern. We'd like to follow patterns. That's number one. Okay, so the debate is whether it's kosher or not. Then, then you feel it's too distant. You might believe in it, but it's a belief that's like almost unbelievable. You know, you know, it's like when you say, "I believe in something unbelievable," and I don't. It's almost like uh, to give you an example of somebody who says that is Yeshaya Leibowitz. He has a whole thing about he totally doesn't really think the chef is going to come because it, it doesn't fit in with his logic. But he's a religious Jew, so he's stuck with believing in something he doesn't feel at all. And he talks about, like, the, basically this big divide in him. Like, I know I don't really buy into this thing, but I'm a religious Jew, so I'm stuck with it. I, I'm not agreeing with it. I'm just giving you an example to help us understand what I'm not going to say. Oh, so how do you bring it closer? Oh, okay, okay. So I, th I think I think all of these things are great metaphors for making something more. Bring it down to size, like Lahavdo. The the Christians have Yashka. They have a they're able to embody God into a person. We have a Sukkah. The Sukkah is our way of being reminded of God's presence, of the the Ananiak Kaba. So mitzvahs, you learn the Torah like this, and you start saying, "Oh, okay, this is uh, this represents a certain relationship with God. I experience a certain thing. Our history is such. So, for example, like if what's going on in the world right now, I don't like to say, okay, the Kabbalah says predicts this and this will happen. But if, the, if you look at the Kabbalah, what it does say is there's this." relationship between the Holy One, blessed be He, and the Shekhinah. And that manifests in, in, in on an earthly level when we're able to be in our homeland. Because that's that the homeland, the land represents Malchut. And when we can be in the homeland and manifest the divine in the homeland, so then there's a unification between the Holy One, blessed be He, Yisod, Tiferet, and Malchut. And when there is an alienation, 
then there's galut, then there's exile. When you're in Eretz Yisrael and there is a rupture, there's something like a, a korban. So that's a galut even within the land of Israel. There's some type of darkness that's disconnecting the flow from one sphere to the other, which means from us, between us and God. And that's why we, you know, have all of the things like that. So, again, that's just one example. So let's go further in the Gemara. Number two is Rashi. Rashi says something. This is a classic Rashi. You find this all over almost every Mishnah. Rabbi Huda Mash, Rabbi Huda says it's kosher. The Gemara Mefarsh Plutayu. The Gemara will explain what the argument is between Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis. Does anybody know any first page or two of Sukkah? No one. Okay. Does the Gemara explain the debate between the rabbis and Rabbi Yehuda? It doesn't. It doesn't. The closest thing it, that I can kind of think of that it does is that they have an argument, I believe, on about 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 Hamalka. That's that's the closest they have to have any. Uh, let, let me let me take a look at what it says. Yes, within rabbi, within the rabbis, there's a three way argument. There's a three way argument to understand why the rabbis say what they say. Rabba, Rabzer, and Rabba, and we'll get to that in a moment. But that's not between the rabbis and the Yehuda. So it seems that Rashi is what we say, low duck, not being careful. The debate, the opinion of the rabbis of the debate between the Yehuda and the, and, and the rabbis will be explained in the Gemara. That's what Rashi should have said. But instead, you could say he was lazy. And he just said the debate will be explained in the Gemara when in fact only one side, one opinion of the debate will be debated about what they were saying. I'd like to suggest that that's not the case. By the way, when I saw this question, I was like, oh, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Today, Yeshua asked this question. I'm, I'm looking for um, the thing about Hilmi Hamalka. It does say on the bottom of Basim at Basim, on top of Gimel Amad Aleph. Yeah, because we talked about it, Zach, remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that there was a debate, or there was a story with Queen H Helena. Queen Helena. I just call her Hilmi, but it's Helena. That she had a very tall sukkah. It was higher than 20 amot. And the rabbis were there with her, and her. she had all of these children with her. They didn't say anything. And Rabbi Yudas says, look, I'm right. If the rabbis had an issue with it back then, they would have said, look, you're, it's not a kosher sukkah. Next year, make sure it's lower or do something about it. They didn't. So they, they started saying, well, she was a woman. She didn't have to be in a sukkah. But uh, what about her seven sons? So one of them had to be old enough to not actually bar mitzvah. It's just a whole crazy story there. So... That doesn't really seem to give an explanation. It's just a story. The, the Gemara will offer into the story questions and answers about how to understand the rabbi's point of view. But what I think the Pnei Yeshua suggests is that since there are three opinions of what the rabbis held, why they held, that each one of them was having was embodying what they felt the rabbi's opinion were, and Rabbi Yehuda, according to each one of them, would be responding. Would have he, Rabbi Yehuda had three. He didn't know this at the time, but when he made the statement that it's not kosher, there were there are three ways of explaining his opinion as well. Now it's a little bit of a creative reading of the Talmud. The Pnei Shua is very creative. The Pnei Shua is a big defender of Rashi. So who answers Rashi's question when Tosfos asks a question on Rashi? Often, the Pnei Yeshua. Who asks a question when other people would, God forbid, ask this question on Rashi? And like I did so terribly say, maybe Rashi wasn't being so careful. Who will defend Rashi? Pnei Yeshua. That's his job. He defends Rashi. So he says, look, if you read the Gemara carefully, 
it's got to be that the, the different opinions of explaining what the rabbis held are in fact, well, each one will say that Rabbi Yehuda disagreed with them because they acknowledge that there's a debate in the Mishnah. They're Amorayim. Rabbi, Rabbi Zayin, Rabbi are Amorayim. They're explaining the job of an Amor is to explain what the Tanayim meant when it's not explicit. And I'm going to show you that as we go further, what their three opinions actually are. And the Ritva actually says clearly this in some of those instances. The Ritva says, for example, when the Gemara says, the opinion of Rava, and Abaya argues with Rava, Abaya is taking the side of Rabbi Yehuda, or <laughs> something like that, or not, or, or, or um, Abay, Abaya's argument. Rava will say, Abaya, you made a good point. I'll use that to explain Rabbi Yehuda the Mishnah. You're arguing on me. Guess what? I'm only representing the rabbis, but there's another opinion. Good, you're bringing out a good point. So use your opinion to be creative in supporting the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda and the Mishnah. I'll explain it to, the, to you in more detail when we get to it. But, but that's the, the basic premise here, is that if you understand Rabbah and Rabbah and Rabbi Zera, what they're saying, you'll also understand how they understand Rabbi Yehuda as well. So it will, in fact, according to the Pnei Yeshua, answer, explain their arguments. You have to, you have to, I would never know this. I would never, I wouldn't have known the question without the Pnei Yeshua. I wouldn't know the answer without the Pnei Yeshua. And the Ritva supports the Pnei Yeshua, even though the Ritva was a Rishon and the Pnei Yeshua was Acha and the Pnei Yeshua was, I, I believe he might have been related to the Baal Shanta. It's a relationship to the Baal Shanta. Anyway, so there's a 500 year gap between them, but there's still, the Ritva is bringing a support 500 years earlier to the Pnei Yeshua. That's number two. Number three is a very important Rashi, very significant Rashi. Rashi says, uh, the, I'll read the mission very quickly. Uh, the, this, uh, the, the third line, if it's not 10 Tvachim high, it doesn't have three walls. Or there's more sh more sunlight than shade, it's possible in all those three instances. So Rashi, the third line, when there's more sunshine than shade. So Rashi says, right? the, mi the minority, which is the schach is in the minority, becomes nullified to the majority, which is the sunlight, and it's like it isn't. Why? Why is Rashi saying that? What's bothering Rashi? So one of the Rishonim, I believe, says that Rashi wants to make clear that the only debate in the Mishnah is between the rabbis and Rabbi Yehuda about the height of the sukkah. Now, Rabbi Yehuda says it could be higher than 20 amot. It's fine. The rabbis say it cannot be. But they don't debate. They're both in agreement that if the majority of the roof is open to the sun, then it's not a kosher sukkah. And how do we know that? Well, the obvious, you don't have to really know that. It's Rashi. The Gemara, is, the mission is clear about that. But okay, let's say you make a mistake and think that. Well, Rashi is telling you there's nothing to debate. You can't say a little bit of schach is like enough of the schach. Why would I think that? Because it could be the way some of the Amorayim will learn is that the problem with the very high sukkah is you really only have a little bit of stock. If you think about it, a small little sukkah, very 50 feet high, how much of uh, are you sitting in the shade? Very little. That's Reb Zera's point. You're probably not sitting in the shade of the stock. You're probably sitting in the shade of the wall. That's Reb Zera's puzzle. So maybe Reb Yudin is like saying, you know, just have sukkah. I don't care. God doesn't care. That how hot about the you know don't worry about it. don't be such a scientist. He's getting annoyed at the people looking for bugs in the water. 
maybe maybe that's Rabbi Yehuda's shita, and maybe he's also lax about needing a majority, needing needing equal or more schach than shade. Comes Rashi and tells us, no, 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 no. If you don't have enough, if you don't have at least half or more schach, then you have no schach at all. It's not a little kosher. It's nothing. You can argue about whether if the shade is giving you the shade because because it's a very tall sukkah. That you can argue about all day and all night. But you have to. It starts with you need to have schach because that's the essence of the sukkah. That's where the sukkah comes from. Yeah, yeah. So that's number three. So that's that's according to that Rishon. That would make sense why he's saying that. Rabbi Soloveitchik asked the same question. He didn't ask the same question. I asked the same question that Rabbi Soloveitchik asked in this Rashi. And Rabbi Soloveitchik has another answer. Not like this, this answer I gave. He gives an answer that sometimes you could have done a mitzvah but you didn't do it properly. You had a puzzle sukkah. You had a sukkah that wasn't kosher. He says, and, and that's what the Mishnah seems to say. He says, no, it's worse than that. He says, you didn't have a sukkah at all. Because if it's like, it's like it wasn't there at all. It's not like, you know, I didn't have such a good sukkah. The, the rabbi came and told me there's a problem with the sukkah. He says, no. The rabbi came and told you you don't have a sukkah. Very brisker. Like it's not even a it's not a puzzle sukkah it's not a sukkah at all, and um, okay so that's the that's the brisker Torah on that so let, now let's go to number four. The end of that same Rashi. Don't go further than that Rashi. He says Val Shem Kriya Sukkah. We call the sukkah by the schach. Why does now this is really strange? Why does Rashi have to tell us this here? I mean. What is he adding to the Mishnah by saying that? Does he really want to bring Rabbi Soloveitchik's point home all the way? That this is just not a sukkah. You don't have a sukkah with a disqualification. You have no sukkah. Okay. So, Rabbi Soloveitchik beautifully in Mishima Shiorim talks about now, what Rashi is trying to say is what exactly is the sukkah? And what's the heksher sukkah? It needs walls and it needs schach. Are they equal? Or is the sukkah, the name of the, because the name of the sukkah is because of the schach, the schach defines what the essence of the sukkah is, but the walls help define where the schach is. Over this structure, these are the walls of where the schach will be. So you need the, the the walls to make a kosher sukkah, but it's the actual schach which makes it a sukkah. There'll be different things. For example, is there a specific thing you have to make the walls out of? There's a debate about that in the Gemara. It's based on a biblical verse, how you read it, because they did, there's a verse that says they use a lot of the same things that we use actually for the four species they use for the schaf and the walls yeah because it's based on the verse but there's some extra words in the verse or some other things that we learn out that it's really just anything wood or anything you want to make uh, for the for the schaf and for the walls as well there's one opinion that says there has to be certain parameters of how you make the walls but that's not the halacha so let's go with what the halacha is and say that another law is that you cannot benefit from the sukkah throughout the holidays. It, it's muksa. Muksa people associate with Shabbos, certain things you can't use. But actually, it has to do with kachim, with sanctified objects that you're using, consecrated. You can't just use them for yourself because they have they're designated for the Beit Hamikdash. The the Gemara later on will use a reference that correlates the Kedusha and the removedness of Kachin, of sacred objects, to our ability to not use the Sukkah during Sukkah for some other purpose. Let's say I decide I, I don't have a broom. Back then, they used 
different types of like palm fronds as brooms. So I take the palm fronds and I use it as a broom during circus. Multi-use. It's forbidden. Maybe even biblically forbidden, depending on how you read it. Tosus discusses it. Okay. What part of the circus is forbidden? Is it just the schach or is it also the walls? Can I take part of the wall and use it for something? And this is a debate. R Rambam says the walls are also forbidden. They're off limits. Rashi seems to indicate that it would probably only be the schach. In fact, the rush quotes the Rambam, argues with the Rambam, Rabbi Asher, and basically says, like Rashi, no, the real essence of the sukkah is the schach. So when it, when we say it's designated for the seven days, you can't use it for other things, it's not talking about the walls. So there, so we're, uh, we're, we're showing at least two ways to look at the sukkah, that either the essence is the schach, and the walls are secondary, or they both have that sanctity. The sukkah is the schach with the walls. The ritva puts it in other words. The ritva is great. Uh, ritva is very important on sukkah. The ritva, so, sometimes one, of, one or other of the Mishana will step up to the plate in a particular tractate and get like really get more involved than it most. So the ritva says, look, if you want to know what the sukkah is, sometimes it's all about the schach. Sometimes it's about the schach and the walls. He doesn't want to take a side. He can say, well, sometimes it's both, and sometimes it's one over the other, depending on the circumstance. Okay, that's number four. And number five is the Gemara contrasts itself to the mission in Erebin. And I'll just quote the beginning of the Gemara. Let's take a look at the Gemara. It's non Hasam. It says in the first mission, Erebin, Mabishu Gvar, Masim, Ama, Yemayat. If you have that. Cross beam, what would be called today an Erev? Uh, if it's higher than 20 amas, you have to lower it. What, and that's the opinion of the rabbis, Rabbi Huda argues. Why don't we have the same explanation given here in our discussion about the height of the sukkah as there? There it's all about, I said, what we compare the height to in the, in the Beit HaMikdash. What do we learn it out from? Which is very beautiful to think about. We're talking about the height of an Erev and to reference things in the Beit HaMikdash here. We have an architect here. In other words, it's telling us architecture is important. Just like the temple had a certain structure, a certain size, and imposed a certain grandeur, but no more. Grand, but not too grand. So our 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 a visual of certain things are equal to that and should only be that high and no higher. Otherwise, they're not going to be kosher. Okay? So to answer why it's so different, we have to really do number six and seven. Actually, seven and eight and nine. So we'll get, we'll, we'll hold number six, I'm sorry, number five to seven, eight, and nine. We'll, we'll just say for number five, is it's very clear in Arabin that there's only one thing that we're concerned with the visual. The same thing with a, a Hanukkah menorah, the visual. Do you see it or don't you see it? And and how do you decide that? Is it is it pure logic? Do we have a kid that we ask? Or do we look from some precedent in the temple architecture? And the answer is, yeah. You, you know, there's a debate about how to do that. Arkhamara, it's not clear. Why do you need to see the schach? Where does it talk about seeing the schach? And if it's not seeing it, what is it? And that's what Seven, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten. Talk about. It. So we will, in fact, learn how it may be the same as Erevin. Number seven, Laman Yedu Dorosechem, is that you got to see it. So if that's the case, then it's the same as Erevin. And really, the debate is hinging upon whatever Rabbi 
Yehuda argues about in, in, with the rabbis and Erevin is really the same here. So that would explain number two, which is how the Gemara will explain the argument between Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis, because it will explain it. Let, let's quickly go to number. Now I'm going to move very quickly because I have five minutes to do the rest of it. It's just great about a time, you know, you just limit yourself and that's it. Number six, the Gemara is, is the understanding between the difference between Takanta and Pesula. So let's take a look at the Gemara. The Gemara says the following. There it says, Maishna Gabi Sukkah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, three lines into the Gemara, four lines into the Gemara from the Mishnah. Why over there, or why over here by Sukkah, the Tani Psula, Maishna Gabi Mavi, the Tani Takata? Why do the two respected Mishnayot use different terminologies? By Sukkah here, it says Psula, it's disqualified, but by Mavoi, by these Dinim of the era, it said Takanta, fix it. So, yes. Correct. So the Gemara says, Sukkah de Araita Tani Psula, Mavi de Rabbanan Tani Takanta. Sukkah is a biblical law. So we use the word Pasul. Mavoy, it, it's, it's a rabbinic. It's not, it, it, like I mentioned, biblically speaking, that's, that area is really a Rishut HaYachid. The rabbis were considered, it looks like a Rishut Aram, might be confused. So they made certain ordinances to make you less confused. But since it's a rabbinic law, they use the word takanta. Rashi explains. Correct. Yes, it is. But the Mavoy isn't. Rashi explains the following. That Sukkah is Daraisa. We learn out that, the, that it can't be higher than 20 Amat from the biblical law. So before this Mishnah was stated, its measurement was already stated at Sinai. Interesting expression. In other words, when the when the rabbis interpret, so a lot of people think the rabbis came up with this thing, and clearly they, you will not find this anywhere in the Torah that says it took a higher than twenty amot, unless you infer, unless you read it a certain way. Even even in fact, each one of these three rabbis can't agree with one another about why it's not kosher. But they do agree upon one thing, that the rabbis of our Mishnah hold that it isn't. They have three ways of getting there, but they all agree on one thing. But by the way, even the rabbis of our Mishnah had a contemporary Rebihuda that didn't agree with them. Okay, so we'll leave him out because he's a yachid. He's an individual. We don't, we pass in yachid v'rab, malach v'rab, when there's a debate, we follow the majority. Okay, therefore, this is considered a biblical law, even if you don't see, in other words, we don't define biblical law the way that Tzedukim would define biblical law, that everyone is, can see. It's a Pasuk, a Farish, clearly. It, it, even if it's interpretive, it's still considered biblical. And therefore, Tani Psula, Shaykh, the Mishni Balash and Pasul, the next Rashi, you can use the term of Pasul. Kalomar, Lo Nasus, Ketorah, Kalak. What does Pasul mean? It was not done like the Torah states it. It was not done properly. But Mavu, the, the Kula, the Rabbanan, the next Rashi, that all of the laws about Mavu is rabbinic. Biblically speaking, three three partitions, an area that's closed off on three of the four sides, is a Rishus Hayachid, it's a private domain. It doesn't need this cross beam, it doesn't need this string, you know. Only rabbinically. So Tani Tekantis is fix it. The low shack the missing by Lush and Pasal. This is very interesting. It's not it's not it, it doesn't make sense to use the word pasal that it's disqualified. Demand pasal called them Shinish Mishazu. Who before this mission was stated disqualified it? This is the beginning of it becoming like from here on in. The word pasal has a almost like a biblical ring to it. And this gets back to a whole other conversation of what exactly are the rules of the rabbis? They get to make all these decrees, but are they equal to the, the Torah? And the first answer is no, they're not. And their terminology should reflect those distinctions. The, the, if you learn a biblical law, even if it's Allah, even if it's, if it's given over at Moshe Messina, but I can't agree on the reasons for it, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. It's possible. The Torah already disqualified it. That's the bottom line. The rabbis are just letting you know 
what those who already know, know. But if the rabbis are the ones disqualifying it, then they don't tell you at the same time that it's possible. Because they're, the, they're just informing you that that's not proper. How do you inform somebody it's not proper? Well, we say that you should do it the, the correct way. Puzzle has a as has a connotation of something being essential. Another way to explain it would be Hefsa versus Gavra. This is a brisker way of analyzing something. What's the difference between a rabbinic prohibition and a biblical prohibition? One way could be, it's not simple, it doesn't always work across the board, but one simplified way of often explaining differences. If it's biblically prohibited, that prohibition takes effect in the object itself as well. In other words, you say puzzle, the object itself has a disqualification. If it's only rabbinically prohibited, it's not in the object. The object is okay. It's me. I. It's my relationship to the object. It's the chafsa. I'm sorry, it's the gavra. It's the person. It's a subjective thing. It's not an objective problem. Objectively, the, the, the Torah itself, Harsina didn't say anything about it. It's me. The rabbis don't want me to do this thing. So that's why you put in takanta. Pasul is about the object. The kanta is about what I have to do, about the gavra, the person. That'd be a general way to explain that, Rashi. Okay, so that's number six. Rashi is different than his potential grandchildren. Tosus, by the way, not always the grandchildren of, of Rashi. But Tosus doesn't, for some reason, doesn't really love Rashi. And he gives his own interpretation. Uh, his first interpretation is that which is like that Takanta is a better sounding word because it's more positive on the one hand, but on the and Divrei Masal Der Rais a ton of Pesul the second tells us, but on, so we like to say more positive things. So the Gemara Pesachim the beginning everyone remembers like a whole two page spread that ultimately says you you have two conflicting things and sometimes you do one which is nice language and sometimes you do the other which is more concise and it depends on the circumstances so Tosha says makes the point that on the one hand you want to use nice language fixing something is better than puzzle like if I this is at least you'll listen to this about how to talk to my kids this is such a great line if I say what they did is is like wrong then they, they don't want to talk to me for a week if I say, I'm not saying what you did is wrong, but there's something you could do to make it better. Ah, then they're still, they'll only talk, not talk to me for a day. <laughs> Kenny, you're here? Hey, you're with me? It's language. It's not about, it's about how you say it. So you want to express it more nicely, you say Takanta. But here's the other problem. Why do you sometimes yell at your kids and it's worthy of yelling at them? Because they're crossing the street and there's a car and they're not looking. Then you need to yell at them. You don't have to be nice. And sometimes my kids get angry when that happens because I'm always yelling at them when they're crossing the streets about the bikes. I imagine there's always a biker coming there. They know I'm crazy about that. Okay, but you don't have time to be nice. There might be a bike. You're walking into a lane that's it's Amsterdam Avenue. There's a bike lane. There's always, or you actually see a truck coming. I've, I've, I've yelled at people and saved their lives. The second I yell at them, they're like, their feelings are hurt. But afterwards, they thank me. Right? So you don't have, so, so Takanta is, is a nicer word, but it's not puzzle. So what, somebody might misinterpret it and think, Takanta is, do it better, but if you don't have time to do it better, it's okay. So that's Tosus's interpretation. So in, 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 in a sense, Tosus is relying more on the Gemara and Pesachim, which Rashi is also well aware of, about this, this um, need to for conciseness versus need for niceness. And, and they're competing all the time in our lives, these, these, these two. There's a beautiful, I, I see Tosus is more psychological and Rashi more, more brisker, or, you know, very, I had to make a distinction between why they disagree on, the, on number six. Tosus is going to bring you by men that they which makes me think that Rob Nachman was becoming with Kagal. There you go. I have to take a look at the, about that. Yeah, yeah, because that, that brings up a whole other question about why we would say by Nehr Hanukkah, 
puzzle since it's only rabbinic. It doesn't fit in. So he has to give two answers of why. Either because words have to be flexible in context. There it's comparing it like a sukkah. Sukkah is puzzle, so it'll be nigra. It'll be like schlepped along with it. Or, and he gives a second answer as well, that there it, it, it needs to really be like that. Otherwise, it's totally not kosher. Okay. So let's go on a little more very quickly. I'm five minutes late, so I'm going to just do this in a second. This is the meat and potatoes of, of it, but I think we'll uh, we'll break just to keep uh, keep to the schedule. What? Or should do I have five more minutes? You guys tell me. I I, I know people are. The music is going to start soon. <laughs> They're not here yet. One of the musicians is here. Okay, well, so we'll do another five minutes. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to take advantage of your guys' time. I, 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 I asked Mechila of everyone. We'll do it very quickly. But these are number seven, eight, and nine, and ten, or, or whatever they are, are very important. Lemanye de Derasechem, the beautiful Rashi. So let's take a look at that. Number seven, number seven is the Gemara says the following. How do we know the opinion of the rabbis? I'm about uh, 12 lines from the top of the page. Omar Raba, that it can't be higher than 20 Amos. The Omar Kral, the Manye de Derasechen, keep a sickle so shop these today's show. The Torah says, in order that the future, the generations should know that I caused the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot when I took them out of Egypt. Only until 20 Amos, uh, 20, 20 Amos included, does a person realize, meaning because they see it, that they're in a Sukkot. Higher than that, you don't know that. Again, Yaakov, architecture. Your eyes don't see that high. So higher than 20 Amos, you don't see that you're in a sukkah, and therefore you're not fulfilling the biblical verses that you should know. Meaning the sukkah has to be built in the way that you know it. This is an amazing Rashi. Take a look at this Rashi. It's about uh, uh, about 10 lines lower than the Gemara. Not 10 lines, 7 lines lower than the Gemara. Laman Yedu, Zuck Rashi. Make a sukkah that, that you're sitting in a sukkah is recognizable to you. Because it says, Yedu, keep a sukkah so shafi, tzibishi leishim, that I commanded you to sit in them. Achi darishle. That is how we're expounding it. We're making a drasha. Although there's a general principle, Rashi likes to say, that a pasuk doesn't go out of its more simple reading. I don't say literal reading. Rashi doesn't believe in literal readings. And case in point, look what he says here. The heck of an anekavet. That the Tzuntas of Mikra is talking about the clouds of glory. Well, let me ask you a question. Does anybody know what the literal meaning of the Pasuk is? Does it say anything about clouds of glory in that Pasuk? There's actually a debate in the Gemara between the rabbis and Rabbi Akiva. We don't know which opinion is which because they're switched off. One says it's Hanan Akavo. That's what we're remembering. The other one says Sukkah's Mamish. It's just a Sukkah. Rashi Paskins, I don't know why. What's bothering Rashi? Right away, in the first daf, he paskins that the Pshut to Shomikra is a heck of an cover, the clouds of glory. Why does he have to say that? Why? Because Rashi is a different type of Pashtun. He wants to teach you right away that Pshut to Shomikra is not literalism. He rejects biblical literalism. He was a Navi. He knew what was going to come, that all the universities would read the Bible as if it was a scientific text. But it's Pshut to Shomikra, meaning literal reading, which is a scientific way of reading things. It says, no, it, Medrash can be Pshutu Shomikra. So heck if not that covered is Pshutu Shomikra. But let me ask you a question. Why does Rashi bring, it, does he just want to teach you a general principle of En Mikra Yotzeb De Pshuto, that A, doesn't leave its shot, and B, shot is not what you think is shot. In this context of Sukkah, about a rabbi who wants to learn a halacha, about the height of a sukkah rather than a kavana of what you're supposed to have in mind when you're in the sukkah. Unless Rashi wants to say the following. I think that Rashi argue, would arguably say that you need both. 
that the the that even ain mecha yotzim ne pshuta means it continues to mean that you need to know that the sukkah represents the hekef ananei kavod. But at the same time, it also informs the, the height of the sukkah. Can't be higher than 20 amas. That's what I'm learning. But take it or leave it. That's a very interesting Rashi. That's number seven. Number eight is Rab a scientist. Is he obsessed with the bugs, the microscopic bugs of his time? He did a little research. Number seven. Oh, I skipped. No, I didn't skip. Number eight. Uh, go down a couple lines. Uh, no. Um, uh, Rabzera Amar. Back to the Gemara. Smack in the middle of the page. A line, uh, maybe just right below the begin, the, the, the middle. Rabzera says, The sukkah is supposed to be a, a shade. If the sukkah is higher than 20 amas, the Gemara is going to explain it's relatively a small sukkah. If it's a very big sukkah, then it would be fine. But a small sukkah, a little sukkah that's that tall, you're not sitting in the shade of the of the schach, but in the shade of the wall. Because the rabbis knew about the meridian and all that stuff. Reb Zera was a scientist. He says, you need to be sitting. The, if the sukkah is because of the schach, and the schach is for the shade, because the verse says, shade. Therefore, you need to have the shade of the sukkah. If not, it's not a kosher sukkah. Was Reb Zera a scientist? There's only one. May, may, yeah, he wants to be. He wants the one part of the sukkah. He probably holds like Rashi, right? Al shem schach kore sukkah. It's called schach. The, 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 the name sukkah has to, has to function as what it is. It has to provide shade from the schach for it to be a sukkah. But then Abaya will ask a tremendous question, which is number nine. Abaya asks, if you make your sukkah in a, in a valley on Wall Street, so you understand it better, you're surrounded by one hundred-story building on one side, and it's a tiny courtyard. And the other side, another 100-story building. You're never getting any sun, any shade from your schach. The shade is from the two buildings. Ah, so here's where Abzera starts being a scientist. Comes uh, Abzera back and says, Just take away those two big buildings. And then you'll have the schach of the sukkah. <laughs> so, so, um, so, 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 but if you take away the walls in the tiny, tall, super tall, but, but small sukkah, you won't have any shade from the schach. Now, that's a weird thing. Abai is saying, the problem with science in Torah is once you start using science to interpret Torah, then you, you're always going to limit yourself. I'll say, oh, I'm not really getting shade because of the wall, because of the neighboring building. Like you think we're sitting in, I'm going to wait till I have shade from the schach. You'll never be, you'll never be, yours. what about at night? <laughs> once you start, where do you end? Aim the devil so. And, 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 and the Rebbe says, no, I could use science and limit it. I could say, I don't have to look at the buildings around me or the valley that I'm in. I could, I could, I could have an imagination to pretend they're not there. But if I never have schach providing me with shade, then I don't have a sukkah. Comes, comes the ritva and says the following. I can conclude with this. The ritva says the following. He says, you know what? Reb Zera has a perfect explanation of the debate between Reb Yehuda and the Mishnah and the rabbis of the Mishnah. The rabbis of the Mishnah hold that, like I do, that you need to have shade from your schach, and if and if you but but you could take away the buildings, but the wall's still there, and if it's a tall sukkah, you don't have the shade. Rabbi Yehuda would argue and say, if you could take away the buildings, I could also take away the height of the walls. This is the ritva. It's a beautiful ritva. As if you're imagining that the buildings are not there, imagine that it's a shorter sukkah. What's bothering you? In other words, if you, if you don't believe in real science of Zara, you believe in the half science. The rabbis don't believe in real science. They believe in half science. 
That's the Ritva. Anyway, it also that that explains Rashi as well. Meaning we have so many heterim in the sukkah to make a sukkah have three walls or to make this, you're right, right, to consider tent fachim or lavod and Nakuma. Why do you have to be so upset about the height of the sukkah? You you could take away the, the Asharis Karnaim, take away the mountains, and it would, if you would take away the mountains, I would have schach. So take away the height of the sukkah, meaning it's not science. It's not, Torah is not science. According to even according to Rab Zero, who says Torah is half science, he admits that if Yehuda will say Torah is not science. Anyway, thank you guys. Please stay for the for the for the rest of it. Hey. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs>